Um, I'm Ian Cross, I'm currently faculty chair, and it's my great pleasure today to introduce Professor Catherine Ellis for her inaugural lecture. Catherine, as is well known to most of you, is one of the leading experts in the cultural history of music in France during the 19th century, and its overspill forwards and backwards. Musicology, history, French studies, reception history, opera, the institutions of music, all of these are part of Catherine's empire. Um, she's been director of the Institute for uh, Musical <coughs> Research at the University of London School of Advanced Studies. Um, she's a fellow of the British Academy, she's director at large of the American Musicological Society, um, and uh, a member of the uh, American Philosophical Society. She has played a central role in shaping musicology in this country and abroad, and projecting the image of musicology in this country <laughs> abroad. And I hope very much that she will continue to do so as our 1684 professor, Catherine. Thank you very much, Ian. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Good. Thank you. It's a pleasure and an honour to see so many friends, colleagues and students here. Thank you all for coming. As many of you know, our graduate colloquium is usually more intimate, but in a small faculty, inaugural lectures don't come along very often, so today seemed like a good excuse to celebrate the new academic year. I'll speak for around 50 minutes, and there will, I promise, be visual and oral distractions along the way. You'll be wondering about my title. It relates to the question I'm most often asked by graduate students, by non-specialist friends, and of course, by archivists. What are you looking for? And while I never tell archivists that I'm looking for trouble, because it might send the wrong message, it's precisely what I say to everybody else, because it encapsulates a way of thinking that has guided my historical work for many years. It's related to the idea of the normal exception, the oddball, culturally transgressive event that stirs up controversy and is recorded and its trace is preserved for the very reason that it overstepped accepted boundaries. The danger of such work is of constructing nothing but tales of the bizarre. The benefit for the cultural historian is that it can provide one of the few ways to think about what constitutes the normal, the unremarkable, the usually unspoken. And it helps calibrate expressions of self-censorship and proclamations of difference alike. Admittedly, it's indirect evidence, but it can be translated into useful knowledge. And it can also help spotlight those who've spoken, but whose voices have gone unheard by history. And in the context of my current work on music, the state, and the local in provincial France, a diluted version of the idea amounting to a search for moments of tension, dispute, resistance, and negotiation pervades the research I've been undertaking for the last several years. This afternoon, I'd like to show you some of those ideas in action. And my chosen lens is that of music education, specifically the conservatoire system as it operated in France between the 1830s and the 1930s. The fact that we all know what a conservatoire is and that its core function is to train practical musicians and composers is testament in the first instance to the international reach of a model established in Paris in 1795. The continuity is such that when I look at my own library of violin studies, which unfortunately you see behind me, they contain precisely the same composer names that pop up in the Paris curriculum and all across the provinces, Kreutzer, Matzas, Nongla. My library also contains legacies from German and Eastern European conservatoire systems, notably on the right, the terrifying late 19th century discipline of Shevchik. 
but where in the France of my period might we find Shevchik's studies in use? Nowhere, as far as I can tell, except Strasbourg, as a continuing legacy of its German years from 1870. And that tiny example suggests my first task, which is to point out that irrespective of the regime, and we're talking about one monarchy, two republics, and an empire, it's quite a shopping list, France was a centralized country with a big state. The job of the Ministry of Education, linked variously with fine arts and or religion, was not to facilitate initiatives coming from the provinces, but to work the other way round to provide a structure that delivered proportionate doses of healthy, authorized content nationwide, a system that would bind the country in a spirit of what's known as unity in uniformity. It was neat, tidy, efficient, and identity forming in theory. Three levels of oversight and reporting were necessary to, to implement this uniformity. The ministry in Paris, the Prefecture County Hall, where the prefect was a civil servant on a tour of duty, and the town council, the operational centre, whose mayor was a local answerable to the prefect. For the national conservatoire branches in provincial France, we can add the director, who was the only staff member appointed by the ministry and who was therefore also technically a civil servant. Amongst other things, it's the rub between these levels of authority especially when fanned by the local press and amplified by polemic pamphlets, memoirs, and letters that interests me. In terms of music education, what disappeared with the revolution in the 1790s was the system of around 400 church choir schools called maîtrises dotted around the country, which you see on the left of the screen. They were initially replaced from 1795 by that single dot on the right, the Paris Conservatoire, a secular meritocratic institution providing free tuition, food and lodging to children and young adults who auditioned successfully. It was designed to provide what the state determined the country now needed, military band musicians to play at outdoor festivals, orchestral players and singers trained as soloists for the opera. And what did the provinces, now département, what did they need? To be fair, the state didn't forget them. But various attempts to set up a national network, a case of administrative centralization to achieve artistic devolution, failed for lack of money. And it was in this unstable environment that provincial conservatoires of the 19th century were founded by wealthy citizens as offshoots of music clubs and bands and as council-run institutions serving local needs. The maîtrises, too, began to reform themselves and gradually became part of the national picture. By 1884, the government had nationalized 27 of these institutions at designated primary and secondary levels of education. And by the 1930s, the system comprised 43 of them. The ideal was a system whereby consistency of preparation enabled the best students to proceed smoothly to Paris to finish their studies. It was a pyramid. But we have to be careful with the word nationalize. It didn't mean full state funding or anything like it, and I'll come back to the dirty question of money towards the end. On paper, these, looks, these schools look like identikit institutions. In practice, they were not. Marseille was opened in 1822 to train tenors and basses for its own opera chorus. Dijon was doing the same as late as 1881. The ethos at Metz was to keep fine instrumentalists rooted in the city as teachers and orchestral principals, and it had no vocal classes until 1869. Toulouse was the precise opposite, a specialist opera singer factory for most of the 19th century. Up in the industrial north, where you see that cluster, the northeast, you see that cluster of conservatoires, Roubaix was highly unusual, priding itself on teaching brass and wind band instruments. For several years, Bordeaux, 
included a plain chant school. Aix-en-Provence, Perpignan, and Lorient all tested out the idea of classes in local folk musics, though nothing here survived moves towards requesting nationalization. As that last example suggests, French conservatoire history includes examples of local entrainment or self-censorship in line with state-approved norms. But in the face of diversity, the state's uniformity reflex, as I call it, also catalyzed serial disputes, especially after inspections or when new regulations had to be drafted and signed off by directors, mayors, and prefects. At stake, in many cases, was the very notion of what musical education was about and whom it should serve. Hence, an especially hard-fought rewrite of 1854 at Lille started with a mayor's protest against the elitism brought by a Paris-driven meritocracy, which also bled the best emerging talent from the regions. The school's aim, this is the mission statement, is to extend the benefit of musical education as widely as possible among lower income families, not only for prodigiously talented young instrumentalists who are seen destined to become top flight artists or to become successes in the theater, but also to train teachers and instrumentalists capable of rendering services to local music societies. The local prefect had to sign off that text, which must have been uncomfortable since it espoused precisely the opposite of what he was there to ensure. At the other end of the scale, there was the problem, and it was a problem, of overachievement. Nancy, run from 1894 by the Breton composer Guy Roparts, was told in an inspection of 1909 to stop aiming so high, since it was not his job to produce the finished article. He had apparently a mistaken notion of the goal of provincial music schools. The rationale of a national branch, wrote his government inspector, was not to copy the Paris Conservatoire, but to give the greatest possible number of children an elementary artistic education. Somewhere in the middle, anonymous and compliant, lay the perfect feeder school. And in what follows, I'd like to concentrate on two tinderboxes of the middle of the 19th century, before reflecting more generally on the power relationships of which these and other disputes are part. I've already mentioned the first, the musical education en masse of working class men. And the second is familiar from a host of Renoir paintings of bourgeois domestic scenes, girls at the piano. With working men's education, dissonance between center and region stems from the Paris system's transparent ageism and its capacity to compartmentalize musical experience to an extent that was neither possible nor desirable in smaller centers. If for a moment we compare the mid-century situation for opera, we see that Paris had a theater rooted contractually in each major genre. French Grand Opera, Italian Romantic Opera, Opera Comique with Dialogue, and Operetta. More or less, there were fights over this too, they were kept apart. In the regions, that was impossible, and a single theater, or at most two, would put on all these genres. The analog in Parisian music education was that the conservatoire trained secular musicians individually as proto-soloists, the School of Church Music, the Ecole Niedermeyer, did what it said on the tin. And for the masses, there was a system of general education called the Paris Orphéon, organized by the Paris City Council into right bank and left bank choirs. These latter groups, essentially a form of adult education, didn't exist as part of the Paris Conservatoire, since there was ostensibly no career path ahead for its singers. And nationalized conservatoires soon found that the state didn't support the Orphéon that not only nested within them, but had sometimes been the catalyst for the entire institution. If I take one of the most famous Orphéon choruses dating from the early 1870s, you'll see why they don't fit the utilitarian or careerist model. Um, 
what I wanted you to hear was um, the Martyrs of the Arena by Laurent Dorier, um, translated into an English translation and sung by a Welsh choir. This is um, uh, a chorus which is all really about not operatic singing, but a particular mode of pacification of working class um, individuals where the very participation and the very idea of singing together is a way of knitting together individuals into a collectivity. And in an official conservatoire context, these people are just out of place. And when they're not berated by inspectors, they're simply ignored. But it wasn't just the repertoire. Under director Tommaso Barsotti, the Conservatoire at Marseille became well known in the early 1840s for a choral tradition requiring the full SATB range, with upper parts taken by boys. The Paris inspector Baton complained about teaching students to run before they could walk, but Barsotti and his colleague Castellan persisted in the classics, extracts from Handel and Mendelssohn oratorios, the Mozart Requiem, Rossini's Stabat Mater, and choruses from Fidelio and Moise, all of which they performed publicly. These traditions came under threat in 1852, when a new and Paris-appointed director arrived. This was the composer Auguste Morel, himself originally from Marseille, but a staunch centralist with little empathy for local culture, who soon became viewed as something of a state apparatchik to be opposed at every opportunity and ousted, if at all possible. Toward the choir, he showed either deliberate or boneheaded insensitivity. Timetabling two-hour choral classes every two days instead of an hour's class daily at lunchtime was, wrote Castellan, effectively to expel all the students. Since so many were laborers or employees unable to let conservatoire attendants eat into the working day. This was a significant loss. By his own account, Castellan's class comprised over 120 singers. Morel was indeed ousted in 1872, by which time he had suspended all collective music making and was accused of favoring wealthy students whose parents could afford the extra tutoring that brought prizes and graduation to Paris, which was what mattered most to him. Whether in Orpheon classes or elsewhere, retaining lower class students was a perennial problem to which no Parisian model could provide a solution. In 1840s Toulouse, the director Louis-Alexandre Piccini was quite clear that his job was to produce voices, both men and women, for the capital. Many of these came from working class and artisan backgrounds, and his task was hindered by the fact that, as you see on the screen, as soon as they can earn money, their parents, not just artisans but also laborers, withdraw them from the course. It was particularly galling with male singing students whose voices had broken because they represented considerable municipal investment in precisely the raw material that Paris required, especially tenors. This is doubtless why, by the mid-1870s, we find Toulouse operating a municipal system of what are called jetons de présence, vouchers compensating working students and or their employers for time spent learning at the conservatoire. Lille investigated something similar the following decade for exceptionally promising but impecunious adult singers. Even when they reached the threshold of a funded place in Paris, working class students from the provinces found that the Paris Auditioning Committee struggled with non-standard applicants. Two Marseille singers, a tenor and a bass, were auditioned in October 1859 on the recommendation of the composer and government inspector, Ambroise Thomas, with limited success. In correspondence with Auguste Morel the following March, Thomas explained, in my last report to the minister, I mentioned this situation and I said that if one of these young men had been younger and if the other had not been married, 
their exceptional voices would probably have got them full bursaries with accommodation. Both were instead offered external places with no funding. It was an outcome that Thomas presented to Morel as good news, a rather paternalistic indication that Morel's conservatoire was on the right track. And in centralist vein, Morel seems to have agreed. Now, contemporary disparagement of culture in the French provinces was rife, and it might make us skeptical of Thomas' reference to exceptional voices as a way of fobbing Morel off. So who were these potential students? Well, it turns out they were not no-hopers, and they weren't nobodies. And the older of them, the tenor Charles Lafranc, was possessed of the very gold dust audiences craved. So what you would have heard um, was the bit that everybody waits for in the aria A mes amis from Donizetti's opera La fille du régiment a series of octaves from middle C to top C, uh, which is tremendously straining for the voice and was um, a nine days wonder when it was first introduced in Paris. And Lafranc, a former soldier and railway worker, could top that top C because he had at least a chess voice C sharp. And he stayed in Paris, studied on a pay when you can basis, at the private school of Gilbert Dupré, who was the first topsy tenor of them all, and was already causing a sensation by May 1860. By contrast, the bass, Auguste Acomte Boudoresque, also a former railwayman, um, and Lafranc was a, a soldier and railwayman, returned to Marseille, graduated with his first prize, and worked for 15 years in oil lamps and cafe ownership. He was then discovered in 1874, and with no further training and almost no stage experience, he went straight into a decade-long Paris career at the Palais Garnier, the Opéra, and elsewhere. These cases in which the difference of the provinces can be only partially accommodated by the centre show how bumps in the system obstructed the career advancement and attendant social mobility that the state system seemed to promise. They're counterbalanced by the situation enjoyed by my second socioeconomic category, bourgeois girls. Now, it has to be said that women were problematic full stop. In Paris, beneath the extraordinary fact that a few were employed on the teaching staff from as early as 1795, we find a history of secondary status, precarious contracts, struggles over equal pay, and ostracism that extends at least to Nadia Boulanger in the 1920s. We rarely hear women's voices, and historically, they were not generally sought out. This latter is demonstrated quite literally in 1862, when Ambroise Thomas reassured Auguste Morel in Marseille that in 20 odd years at the Paris Conservatoire, he had never once known a woman serve on its teaching committee. And I infer from the correspondence that Morel, one of whose piano staff tended to stand up for herself, had asked whether he could do likewise in Marseille. The problem I want to focus on today, though, is not so much the question of women's careers in conservatoires as their proper place as pupils. Singing accepted, teaching girls gnawed at the heart of what a state-sponsored conservatoire was for. The attitude is exemplified by the 81-year-old Luigi Carabini, director of the Paris Conservatoire, when Paris was drawing up a new set of regulations. Turning to the organ class, which had taken girls since 1819, he wrote to the ministry, organ for both sexes. It should read, organ class for men. There is no point in training female organists. In fact, Carabini was overruled. When the final printed regulations came out in November 1841, a quota system was in place and it said a quarter of the places for pupils in the organ class are reserved for women. We can be astonished at the very idea of a quota system, but in Paris at this time, it was present in all other areas open to women, in dedicated classes for oral, singing, piano, accompaniment, and harmony. 
Once again, the difference of the regions, not least their broader social and musical mission, bred tensions. Officially, they were not supposed to be in the business of turning pupils away. But the moment girls' piano classes began, they mushroomed. The general problem is summed up by André Guéron, writing in 1908, four years into his decade-long tenure as director of the Conservatoire at Marseille, and reflecting on the opening of girls' classes in, in oral, in singing and piano in the mid-1840s. His hyperbole resounds with fear of the new woman and of concomitant emasculation in a zero-sum game. And he writes, the door is forced. On 14th of July, 1845, the Bastille is captured. Women are now inside. In 1908, he had 16 female teachers and 300 female pupils, and he wrote as though outgunned. Without wishing to complain about an event that demonstrates sex equality in free music teaching, I have to say that today the balance has been upset in favor of the weaker sex. If the march of feminism intensifies in all branches of teaching, it's worrying to think about what might happen to men in 20 years' time. Numerically, this imbalance was not just a Marseille phenomenon, nor was it a sudden spike. Bordeaux opened its first piano class in 1863 with 10 pupils and a single teacher. By 1876, both had risen fivefold, and female pianists comprised nearly 27, nearly 20% of the entire student body. There was no piano class for boys, and all the piano staff were female. Among nationalized conservatoires, we see a similar story in Metz, Roubaix, Rennes, Toulouse, and Lyon, where the ratio of female to male pianists at pre-1914 prize givings could be anything up to 18 to 1. To return to Guéron in Marseille, it is, of course, the girls' fault. But without wishing to undermine their individual agency, we can think of this phenomenon another way. The picture that emerges from archival evidence of the mid-century is a combination of social aspiration and class divide, whereby the parents of pretty bourgeois and bourgeois girls leverage the institutional glamour of their local conservatoire, not least its competitions. As the mainstay of French public policy on music education as meritocratic, competitions were always a site of musical tension. But in the provinces, successive displays of female proficiency under the gaze of potential partners could turn them into especially complex battlegrounds where family dignity and social prospects muddied the artistic waters. Singing and harp playing produced a similar phenomenon. The immediate goal was to appear at the crowning event of the academic year, the awards ceremony concert, where every town dignitary plus the newspapers would be present. For conservatoire directors, this concert was a crucial test of the general standards and trajectory of their institution. For female soloists and their families, the test was not just musical, but social. Girls in general, and pianists in particular, challenged the rights of municipal and nationalized conservatoires to their dependence on public funding. For en masse, they raised the specter of education not as vocational training, but as the liberal pursuit of self-improvement, something that was usually acceptable in the provinces, only in the case of lower-class men. As early as 1850, the Toulouse Council voted to bar female pianists from the Paris Conservatoire auditions unless they were truly exceptional. Because if they succeeded, the council would have to subsidize them. And they were a major reason why even some of France's nationalized conservatoires charged student fees or found other ways to provide liberal education at no cost to the taxpayer. From the 1830s, Metz had charged pupils from the leisured classes, meaning in practice that massed singing and wind instruments were free, but classes for strings, piano, and harmony of which the largest was the girls' piano class, were fee-paying. And at the end of the century, 
then imposed fees across the board in 1897 and balanced them with grants for the needy. And that seems to have been the only way to stave off closure by councillors who complained that the Conservatoire had betrayed its original purpose by failing to educate workers, preferring instead to expand the skill sets of the leisured classes in the playing of decorous salon instruments. And what of provincial boys? The official view was clear. For them, the piano was a workhorse instrument and little more. Hence, Ropaltz at Nancy was warned by his inspector in 1895 that the piano was not just for girls. It's abnormal, he wrote, not to offer boys tuition in piano. The piano creates accompanists and organists, and it's from this perspective that such tuition has its proper place in a conservatoire branch. And in 1898, he duly opened a class for boys alone in organ and piano. Now, change comes because in provincial France as elsewhere, it's these salon instruments, not just the piano, but also the violin, that become the bedrock of provincial symphony orchestra concerto programming. And these concert series often attach to the local conservatoire with teachers in principal uh, desk positions, are increasingly prized as markers of urban gravitas, sometimes even outstripping the opera as a status symbol. Post-World War I, the orchestras at Toulouse or Bordeaux attracted star pianists who remain household names. Marguerite Long, Vlado Permuter, von der Landowska, and a certain Monsieur Prokofiev. Within conservatoires too, repertorial and organizational change by the early 1930s suggests that the problem of the feminized salon piano had dissipated somewhat not least through diversification and through decisive moves beyond secondary level teaching repertoire. Inspecting Lyon in 1930, César Abel Estil was little short of ecstatic about the pianistic repertoire he heard, which ranged from Bach Bussoni to the Schumann Concerto, to one of the most difficult pieces of its age, Ravel's Scarbo from Gaspard de la Nuit. And he also picked up on a, on a highly unusual embrace of contemporary music, performance of a two-year-old sonatine by the young Lyonnais composer, Pierre-Octave Ferrou. Institutionally, Bordeaux was even more ambitious than Lyon and set up an advanced interpretation class, a diploma class in effect, in 1932, including solo works and, unique in France as far as I can tell, an end of year concerto competition with full orchestra. Starting with the director's own instrument, the violin, it expanded in 1936 to include piano, and it never went any further. This latter marked a decisive moment of professionalization. And in its artistic ambition, it extended even beyond provision at the Paris Conservatoire. Now, you might wonder how this can be, given that, as I suggested at the outset, the centralization of the state was so pervasive and its hierarchical structures so rigid. And so to my final section. The short answer here is that Bordeaux was purely municipal and its director could do as he liked. But the counterfactual is useful. What would have been his levels of freedom if Bordeaux had agreed to go national? And the answers here depend on when. By the 1930s, the inspectors of music in Paris know that the neatly stratified system within which they work is utterly broken. Freedom, especially to be ambitious, ceases to be such a problem. 50 years earlier, the civil servants of the Ministry of Education proclaim authority publicly, but because they pay very little to support their own national conservatoires, they have limited power, and they're already well aware of this. Let me give you some context from 1877, when the state funded its provincial conservatoires to an average of 16%. 
as the network and its inspection regime expanded, this percentage by 1914 had remained somewhat stable at 16.5, but it brought grotesque inequalities between old and new institutions. And you might, if, you can, if you've got very good eyes, see that Avignon has a, a, a municipal budget of 20,000 francs and a state subsidy of just 75. Um, while Lille, which is much, much older, has um, a, a municipal budget of 46,500 and a state budget of 10. If you look further to the right of the screen, by 1930, inflation had shredded state support to just 3% of total costs, with none of the inequalities resolved. And you have the grotesque um, instance of mess down at the bottom of the screen, which has um, the municipality putting in two and, um, 250,000 francs and the state paying 100 per year. I'd like to go back to 1877 and to dwell on an internal memo produced in the Ministry of Education for sending to the Minister of Foreign Affairs. And this, I hope, will illustrate what I mean. The officials involved laid out with perhaps inadvertent clarity the catch-22 of authority and power within which they worked. On the screen, I hope the strike-throughs are self-evident and the new text is in italics. So the first version reads, to date, the Paris Conservatoire has exerted almost nothing beyond a purely moral authority on its branches. But it is the state that nominates the director, who's charged with maintaining teaching along the lines imposed. A special inspector is in addition delegated annually to oversee the artistic quality of the school. Moreover, it should be pointed out that on the one hand, the existence of the school invariably antedating the patronage agreed to by the state, and the subsidy voted in Parliament being modest in relation to the overall costs, the extent of influence of the administration in the organisation of the provincial branches is necessarily very limited. Here's an official text that acknowledges the speciousness of the state's claims to centralising power. It turned out to be far too candid, even for internal consumption. And so we have the spun version of the relationship between the ministry and its branches, talking up the positives. A brand new paragraph. Through the example of its teaching, by the advantages that it offers students who are sent there from its branches, the Paris Conservatoire exerts on the departmental schools a level of influence whose happy results are recognized year on year. It is the state that nominates the director, charged with maintaining teaching along the lines imposed on the branches. A special inspector is in addition delegated annually to oversee the artistic quality of the schools in Lille, Nantes, Dijon, Lyon, Toulouse and Marseille. However, it should be noted that the existence of these schools invariably antedating the patronage requested from the state and the subsidy voted in Parliament being relatively modest, the extent of influence of the central administration in the organisation of the branches must necessarily be rather modest. The new preface reverses the relationship between the two paragraphs. In the first version, paragraph two reinforces a problem. In the second version, it merely tempers a bright vision with pragmatism and realism. It is, of course, doublespeak. The state can inspect and recommend, but unless there is a personnel disaster, it can force nothing because it pays too little to be able to coerce. It's dependent upon a kind of soft power whereby the provinces are hungry enough for the national title to put up with regulation minus meaningful subsidy. In practice, the only and occasionally devastating power of the state was its capacity to cripple an institution that decided to leave the club, to denationalize by repatriating all the benefits in kind, scores, books, pianos, large orchestral instruments, organs, dating from the good times. And the ministry seems to have introduced this idea after the 1884 big nationalization. Among conservatoires, the Saint-Étienne Conservatoire went through that particular grisly mill in 1891 and took a decade to recover. As for the long-term renegades and the lost, well, there were three of them. 
And a few interactions illustrate how state officials who so much as hinted at the right to annex or even help these institutions were pushed away. The first took place at Bordeaux in 1905, when the Conservatoire was not even municipal. It was still a private school run by the Société Sainte-Cécile, a mutual and philanthropic club with orchestra. The composer André Jedalge, then a music education inspector, had visited to report on the orchestra, because the orchestra had since 1873 received state funding as an organization of public utility. But Jedalge exceeded his brief and recommended municipalization and then nationalization of the conservatoire on the grounds that it would be good for Bordeaux's culture and for the southwest of France more generally. As related by the ministry, which is what you see on the screen, Jedalge had found the new director, Louis Penequin, excellent and had noted that the situation of this institution is at present especially brilliant. But were Penequin to leave or the town council to revoke its current subsidy, Jodalge apparently feared that the whole edifice would crumble. And on the subject of administration, his view was that it would be desirable for the selection of the director, as well as the general organization of teaching, not to be left to the free will of a committee lacking a special musical competence. This kind of centralist interference was a red rag. After a meeting between the mayor, the president of the Société Sainte-Cécile and the Conservatoire's committee, the formal response from the president of this society was excoriating. The mayor sided with him and the prefect was invited, A, to agree the committee's recommendation for no change and B, to acknowledge that the institution deserved nothing but congratulation. Anecdotal evidence suggests that at a banquet some time later, this same minister conceded that the Bordeaux Conservatoire could manage perfectly well without the intervention of the state, which was, in any case, offering not one centime of financial support in return for nationalisation. The second major independent conservatoire had already got away twice. Strasbourg went into German administration after 1870 and stayed municipal in 1919, when amid the upheaval of staff leaving to go back to Germany and being forced to leave to go back to Germany, it lured its new director, Guy Ropartz, direct from Nancy. On Ropartz's retirement a decade later, the Ministry of Public Education was quicker off the mark. Writing to the mayor, he claimed his office had received applications from potential candidates, which had it been true, he should surely have redirected. And without naming these candidates in flowery but loaded terms, he offered assistance and cooperation. I know in advance that the prime importance of this succession is far from escaping you given the important mission that befalls the Strasbourg Conservatoire, as much from the perspective of music teaching and the application of the best methods for developing that teaching, as from the particular importance presented by this institution for the future even and for the progress of French art. Accordingly, my administration would be very happy to be in contact with the Strasbourg Town Council to study this question in tandem with you in the hope of collaborating in this way to seek out the best and most propitious solution for your great school. However much time and teamwork it had taken within the ministry to write such a transparently pleading letter, the mayor of Strasbourg didn't even give it the time of day, writing, no need to reply to this letter for filing. This kind of localist, and this is Alsace, possibly separatist behavior towards the state, had also been Ropartz's own modus operandi while director. In response to an early complaint of 1919 that the prefect had not been given free tickets to conservatoire events, Ropartz simply replied that no state dignitaries were ever invited to concerts, the conservatoire being a purely town hall affair. Finally, there was the fraught case of Marseille, which having had a branch since 1841, became notorious in the 1870s. 
Caught between competing desires for autonomy and for recognition, it denationalized in 1872 when it ousted Morel, renationalized in 1874, and denationalized a second time in 1877. While the prefect and the minister could wring their hands and express their displeasure, legally speaking, there was absolutely nothing they could do. In light of these stories of these three conservatoires, it's no wonder that as part of a proposal for a major and decentralist reorganization of the national system in 1933, with the raft of conservatoires that you see on the screen earmarked for higher education status, the inspector Max Dolan lamented at the bottom of your screen, it's a pity not to be able to add to this list the municipal schools of Marseille, Bordeaux, and Strasbourg. And in this connection, I was brought up sharp working in Marseille when I found a brochure for the centenary celebrations of the Conservatoire, dating not, as I would have expected, from 1922, but from 1972, thereby celebrating not the 150 years of its existence, but 100 years of independence after its first tumultuous rejection of state patronage. Musically, in terms of the Conservatoire, 1872 in Marseille was a revolutionary new year zero. And thus proceed the archival dialogues, which include rewritings of French music history. An example like that, where the barbs of localist action suddenly reach into one's own lifetime, is an invitation to yield to broader and presentist temptations. I'm going to give in to them, though not you'll be really relieved to hear for too long. In addition to all the musical tensions, my sequence of archive stories has brought us helicopter parents, battles over widening participation, tensions over grants and fees, equality issues relating to gender balance and to women's representation on policy-making bodies and gender pay gaps. Peripheries have railed at a center that acts as a magnet for money, talent, and investment. Finally, we've seen competing claims of utilitarianism and liberal education at work within a system resting on levels of regulation, inspection, and policy compliance that are wildly disproportionate to levels of state support. Do I really need to ask whether any of this sounds familiar? But in our age of EBACs, facilitating subjects, and other UK educational policies that reduce the entire study of music to a decorative supplement, we perhaps need something more positive to help galvanize our learning from the vicissitudes of a neighboring country's past. In a seminar during my Royal Holloway days, the modern languages scholar Terence Cave once said that music is good to think with, Yes, undoubtedly. I hope my archive stories have illustrated a few reasons why, but there are more. Because as an arts, humanities, and science subject rolled into one, music affords radically different ways of thinking. In an environment where the single lifelong career is less and less certain, this variety is something to be seized on energetically by our students, and trumpeted by everyone in this room at all available moments. I would even say that if the musicologists of the 22nd century, assuming there are any, start looking for trouble in the archives of British music education, perhaps I and you too should be doing more now to ensure that they will have plenty to find. Because if we don't, others are not going to do it for us. Thank you very much.